Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. Thank you all for joining us. We're very excited to talk about poop with you all today. Um, my name is Melissa Pierce. I am a data scientist at Discovery Partners Institute. And I am Caitlin Leisman. I am a research professor at Northwestern University. So uh, what is wastewater? Well, uh, wastewater is, in short, anything that goes into drains, for the most part. Residential and commercial properties, we've got toilets, sinks, showers, washing machines, any sort of water drain is going to go into the wastewater. We also have uh, in Chicago, for example, and other places that have what's called a combined system, um, that residential and commercial wastewater is combined with industrial waste and also with stormwater. And so that means that Wastewater is contributed, it's sort of combined together, and then it travels through the sewer network, and it goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And um, the composition then of that wastewater is sort of influenced by all of those pieces, um, including, you know, if we have precipitation, a lot of rain at one, one time, it's going to be a different situation. Um, the other important thing about wastewater is that, uh, for us, is that... Um, it can give us sort of a big picture view of the health in a community because when people are sick, they will shed virus into their poop, into the wastewater, right? I got the word in. Um, so, uh, and so then we can quantify that, how much virus there is in that wastewater, and that tells us a little bit about how, what the health of the community is. So why wastewater? Why are we using wastewater? Well. It's anonymous, it is inexpensive, and it represents an entire community. So unlike testing data, for example, wastewater does not depend on human decisions in terms of, for example, whether someone's going to go get tested, whether even if they test, are they going to report their test. It doesn't depend on those things. Everyone contributes. Right? And it's also anonymous. It doesn't require that we get sort of agreement to, to participate, right? Um, it's anonymous, we, everyone's, everyone is just in it, right? Um, this data that we get, this wastewater data, can be used by the public health departments in addition to other public health metrics, such as clinical testing, hospitalization data, to make decisions about where to send resources. Um, and the wastewater data in particular is becoming more and more important with COVID-19, for example, as now we have um, so many more at-home tests that aren't being reported and things like that. Um, but it's also helpful for other pathogens that are not commonly tested, like influenza or even... Um, it's helped to detect pathogens sometimes before a case shows up at a hospital, like what happened in uh, New York State with polio last summer. Okay, so we are the Illinois Wastewater Surveillance System. And I know surveillance can be kind of a scary word for people, but in this context, in this field of wastewater-based epidemiology, it actually has a very specific meaning. Um, so monitoring... Um, and surveillance are almost the same, but surveillance has the added addition of um, using the data that you are collecting during monitoring to perform some sort of action. And because we work with public health departments, um, the data is then being used to send resources to different community areas. So that's why we use the term surveillance. Um, just wanted to say it up front so people don't get nervous about that word. Um, but we have two major projects in our program. Um, the first is with the Illinois Department of public health. Um, that includes about 77 wastewater treatment plants across the state of Illinois. Um, they are sampled two times a week by uh, plant employees who volunteer their time to collect a sample and ship it to our lab at UIC. 
The second project we have is with the Chicago Department of Public Health. This is a little different. It's not at the wastewater treatment plants. It's um, what we call upstream sampling. So upstream sampling means you're collecting a sample before it makes its way to the wastewater treatment plant. So this involves pulling up manholes in neighborhoods and sampling there, as well as manholes at facilities like O'Hare and the Cook County Jail. So here's uh, an example of the community level neighborhoods that we sample at for CDPH. And these were chosen um, because they're all in different um, healthy Chicago equity zones. And um, they represent areas that are differentially impacted, um, have different social and environmental impacts um, that contribute to um, health and racial inequity. And so the goal is to focus on those areas to improve um, resources and uh, life expectancy uh, gaps in those communities. I almost said next slide, it's me. <laughs> uh, please, change the slide. Um, so as I mentioned, our program is comprised of approximately, I say approximately because it changes all the time. 77 active wastewater treatment plants across 47 counties in Illinois. You can see in the map in green are all the counties that are represented by our program. This um, includes a little bit more than eight and a half million people in Illinois um, are part of our program, which equates to about 70% of the total population. Now, we can't quite get to 100% because there are folks that are on septic. And so if they're not on a wastewater treatment plant, then, then sadly they cannot be a part of our program at this time. Um, the program started in 2021 just in Cook County um, and was very much smaller. Uh, we um, have since expanded, as you can see, and we have since that time processed over 14,000 samples. And our overall goal for our program is to work towards health equity by reaching as many people in Illinois as possible. So what are we testing for? Right now we are testing for SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. We're also testing for influenza A and B and RSV. But there are quite a few other targets that can also be measured in wastewater, including antimicrobial resistance genes and emer other emerging pathogens. Um, the, uh, the, the targets that we're currently testing for in our program are based on uh, recommendations and, and based on the um, current things of interest and priorities of the public health departments, and also based on some guidance from the CDC. So the workflow that we have in this program is that uh, we have sample collection. So that is in most cases, actually a wastewater treatment plant employee volunteers some time to collect a sample for us and send it to the lab. The lab is at UIC. They, um, at the lab, they uh, quantify the viral RNA in the, in the sample. And then the extracted RNA gets, some extracted RNA gets sent to Argonne National Laboratory for viral sequence or variant sequencing. And the data that we get from this, from all of this gets shared in reports to, let's see, to CDC, um, to the Chicago Department of Public Health, the Illinois Department of Public Health, to um, plant operators, so the wash, wastewater treatment plants that are involved in the project, and um, as well as some other partners that we have. Um, and then finally, we have the uh, data and analytics and modeling teams at uh, DPI and Northwestern University are working on trying to improve the utility and efficacy of the data and also on um, generating more useful and uh, productive visualizations of that data. So the last thing then, then that happens is that visualizations and data get uploaded each week to our Illinois Wastewater Surveillance System dashboard, which Melissa is going to talk about. Yes, our dashboard. Um, 
So our dashboard was created um, in partnership with DataMade, Chai Hack Knight's own Derek Eater, Sam McAlilly, and Forrest Gregg um, have been partnering with us on bringing this dashboard um, to life. So we were very happy to work with them. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of the dashboard, and we encourage everyone to access it on your own after, after this talk. So this is our landing page. The first thing you'll see is that map of all the active wastewater treatment plants in the state of Illinois. Each blue dot is a wastewater treatment plant, and then those green little squigglies are shape files. They outline the boundaries um, of the service area of each wastewater treatment plant. So you can hover over the different data points and it'll tell you the name of the plant. You can click into each one of them um, and it'll take you to the individual page for that plant. And you can see um, the uh, time series plot showing um, the results for that wastewater treatment plant. Um, you can toggle between SARS-CoV-2 results as well as influenza. Um, and then there will be coming soon RSV as well, um, will be a third one. Um, additionally, you can toggle between the linear and the log scale. Um, and then if you're interested, you can download the data um, and it will download the raw data for you to use for any analysis you're interested in. Um, if you are going to download the data, however, please click this about the data button. It's our little readme. Um, it gives you information that you would need before you go ahead and analyze the data, especially if you're not familiar with using um, wastewater data or um, results from PCRs, PCR analyses. All right, so that's um, the individual plant. Then there's some more information below. Um, this is aimed at, you know, if you're unfamiliar, I know this is not the audience, but if you're unfamiliar with reading time series plots, like you might have a question about um, what is the difference between a log and a linear scale, et cetera. Then if you want to look for your specific plant, you can click on locations. You can search by city or county for your wastewater treatment plant. Keep in mind, if you put in your um, location, you might get more than one. So just remember to take a look at those shape files. But for example, let's see, Naperville. Look at that. Here's, and that pops up. And then you can, again, click into the individual page and look at your results and download the data for that location. Um, also, we have an FAQs, which is really great. Um, please also take a look at that. Um, answer any, hopefully answer any questions you all might have. OK, so um, another note about um, the dashboard, you know, you'll you notice that trend line on the time series plots that's displayed. Um, that is a locally weighted scatter plot smoothing, or LOAS. Um, it is a non-parametric technique, which is great because we do not have normally distributed data. And it smooths the data using a series of weighted local regressions. Um, and then you'll notice there's uh, 90 95% confidence intervals around um, the trend line as well. I put it again, please don't forget the README if you're going to download and play around with the data. And I also wanted to mention another place where our data is publicly available, which is the CDC News Dashboard. News stands for National Wastewater Surveillance System. It includes our data. We upload it twice a week, um, as well as every state across the US that participates in the CDC program. Um, there is a difference you will notice between our dashboard and their dashboard. One on the trend, they use just a simple linear regression on 15 days, the last last 15 days worth of data to assess trends and calculate a percent change. And unfortunately, um, they do not allow the downloading of raw data. They, If you try to download for a location, they will just give you that 15-day percent change pre-calculated, and you won't know how they calculated it. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we really wanted um, to work with DataMade and get this publicly available, because the other areas where you could access our data, um, you cannot get the raw data. So that was important to us. Oh, it's still me. Um, and then there's um, one other 
uh, a few other cautionary notes we just want to make sure to point out. Um, the data does tell us the concentration of viral RNA in a sample. The y-axis on those plots is in gene copies per liter, so how many copies of the virus are in each liter of wastewater. Um, and so that's what we know, the concentration from those samples. And we also can see how the trends change over time. Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are they staying the same? Some things that we cannot tell from the data. We do not know how many people are sick just by looking at those viral concentrations. We also um, discourage comparison between um, sites. So don't pull up two different locations and look at the two plots and say, this concentration is, is 5,000 and this one's 7,000. Um, Caitlin is going to explain in a little bit uh, about some normalization that needs to occur. Um, and so you can't directly compare the raw concentrations um, at, the waste, at the different sites. Along the same lines, we also discourage comparing between the different pathogens, even at a single site. So influenza, RSV, and SARS-CoV-2 are all distinct viruses. And so 5,000 gene copies of influenza A and 5,000 gene copies per liter of SARS-CoV-2 might mean to two totally different things. And so we discourage you from comparing those. And as always, wastewater data should be interpreted alongside other public health metrics and not in isolation. All right, so why can't we compare across sites? Well, as Melissa said, um, the data that we get is in gene copies per liter. It's a concentration. But the flow rate, the number of liters that passes through a treatment, into a treatment plant each day, is, varies with different sites, as does the population that is served by that, by that uh, wastewater treatment plant. And so to normalize, we might transform from gene copies per liter to something like gene copies per person, which would be something that's a little bit more comparable across sites. Right? Um, so to, to sort of understand this even further, I like to take an analogy to cases. And so comparing the infection rate in two groups. So if we suppose that group A has 30 people in it, six of which are sick, and group B has 80 people in it, eight of which are sick, if we just compare this number of sick people we would say, well, group B has more sick people, so let's not, let's not hang out with group B. Group A is better and safer, right? But in reality, to think about which group might be in a better place in terms of that virus, we really need to, we really need to normalize and compare, right? We need to look at the fraction of people who are sick to really get an idea of if I go and interact with this group, what's my likelihood of interacting with someone who's sick? Right? And so for group A, we're going to see that one in five people are sick. But for group B, we're going to see that one in 10 people are sick. Right? So it is with wastewater. Wastewater adds an extra element because in addition to populations, we also have leaders. Right? But we need to do that normalization to be able to compare between different uh, locations and samples. Right? And so um, one way that we can do that is by using the flow rate, which for some of, these, uh, waste, some of the wastewater treatment plants that we include in our uh, project, that flow rate is actually available online, um, and also the population to try to normalize. So um, we're using this wastewater to try to understand something about how prevalent SARS-CoV-2 or whatever other virus is in that region, right? And as Melissa mentioned, we can't necessarily say, oh, there's uh, 10 to the fifth gene copies per liter right here, and so that means that there's exactly this many people who are sick, right? But we can say, well, does it sort of trend similarly? Is it correlated, right? So what we see in this plot I have, this is a plot for Calumet, which is one of the larger wastewater treatment plants in Illinois. It's actually the one that serves the south side of Chicago and the south suburbs. Um, and we're looking at data from uh, November of 2021 through the end of 2022. And we are looking at um, these orange triangles are the raw wastewater, so the gene copies per liter. 
And the blue dots are the actually positive tests, uh, at least the reported positive tests in that region, um, approximately the same date. There's a little bit of reporting delays in this testing data. But, um, and I've actually also done a seven day rolling average on the positive test data, okay? Um, we also have this line here is the lowest smoothing line that Melissa also talked about earlier. So that sort of guides the, the eye for the, the path of what's happening there. Um, and I've plotted this on a log scale. Okay. But what we can see is that even just visually, there's a correlation in what's happening, especially at the beginning half of this time series, which is the time when people were actually going out to get tested instead of just doing home tests, right? And so there is some correlation there. And so this, this, there, there's something good that we're getting out of this, right? Um, one question that the uh, data and anal analysis team at Northwestern is trying to investigate is, can we improve that data to get a better correlation, right? And when I say improve that data, I don't mean just like improve processes to get the data, right? I mean, like, can we, can we do things to it, you know, normalizations, corrections, based on other data that we might have or be able to get to, get, to try to turn this into something that's a little better correlated with some sort of public health data, right? Um, and uh, it turns out that it looks like we maybe can. It's something that might be using flow rate. Um, it might use a population biomarker, which is something that we can measure that tells us about sort of how much contributing population was, how, how, many, how much population was contributing to any given sample, and might also tell us about the fecal shedding, which is sort of how much any individual is shedding into the wastewater, right? Um, and then it also may include a decay control, which is something that they can do in the lab to try to see how much the RNA has decayed throughout the processes in the lab, right? Um, something else that we've been working on is some machine learning um, with water quality data. So uh, this is actually some data that's also available publicly for MWRD. Uh, that's the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District in Chicago. Um, takes a little bit of sleuthing to find it. So if you email me, I can <laughs> show you. Um, <laughs> it's also on this link, which has all these numbers and stuff at the end. I was like, is there anything better? But whatever. Um, <laughs> so that data set has things like flow rate. It has like pH. It has suspended solids, which you can imagine what that means. It has, um, uh, it has uh, like dissolved oxygen. It has... Um, like how much nitrogen is in the water and various other chemicals. It's like all kinds of stuff. Um, and the idea is that maybe all of that data that they're collecting will tell us something about the, co the composition of the sewer at the time when the sample was taken. And so that maybe we can use machine learning to try to figure out were there certain days where that composition was particularly abnormal such that the measurement might be less reliable. Right, so that's kind of the idea there. So. Okay, um, so far we've been talking a lot about um, concentrations of the different viruses in the wastewater, um, but if you remember back to the beginning, Argon National Lab does um, sequence the SARS -CoV on SARS-CoV-2 for us. Um, so this is an example of another publicly available um, visualization um, put out by the CDC. Um, it is just for the Midwest region because we don't care about anybody else because um, uh, we're the best. And um, so as you can see, this is just another time series, stack bar plots with the different variants um, and the legend over here. Everything is Omicron forever and ever. Um, it's just a million different um, sublineages of Omicron. Um, and um, I just show this as an example of a way to visualize sequencing data. Uh, we're currently working with Derek at DataMade to um, think about different ways that we could um, add something like this to our dashboard. Um, so um, 
stay tuned for more updates on our dashboard. Like I said before, we're going to be adding RSV. Um, and so it's not meant to be just like a static site that you go to once and download the data. It gets refreshed two times a week with new data. Um, we're always growing our program, adding new wastewater treatment plants, adding new targets, um, and, and different visualizations. So in summary, we did not say poop enough. Um, <laughs> It's really my takeaway, um, sad to say. I also forgot to say, all drains lead to the ocean, except they actually go to the wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> These are the things we want you to learn. Um, no, so in summary, uh, wastewater provides an anonymous, inexpensive, and consistent way to monitor the public health of communities. Um, we can scale it both by geography and different pathogens. Um, it can help fill the gap when clinical data is lacking or completely absent. Um, and that I also want to emphasize that environmental data especially is very noisy. Um, and so we want to use caution when interpreting results. Um, uh, like you saw on the time series plots with the lowest, sometimes we have you know, outliers or spurious high readings, as Caitlin mentioned, um, that could be impacted by whatever is happening in the sewer that day. So please exercise caution. Wear your safety goggles. Um, and <laughs> and um, again, please don't interpret these data without also doing so in conjunction with other public health metrics to, to understand what's happening in a community. Okay, so we want to thank our many, many partners here. Um, there's a lot of folks um, to thank. <laughs> Take a gander. <laughs> and we want to especially point out those uh, volunteer people at the wastewater treatment plants who are collecting those samples and sending them to us. We also want to acknowledge everybody past, present, full-time, part-time who has been working on this program. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of people involved. Um, specifically, I want to do a shout out to Charlie Catlett, the godfather of our wastewater program. Um, he secured the initial funding from the Walder Foundation for $1.25 million to begin this project. So um, because of Charlie and the Walder Foundation grant, um, without them, we wouldn't have this program today. Um, again, there's a bunch of folks, myself included, at DPI. Um, Dr. S Sandra Guessing is in the in the audience today too. Um, UIC, the lab that does all the uh, quantification of all of those samples, led by Dr. Rachel Peretsky, who's our science lead and our project director, um, and, and the lab folks. Um, the whole analysis team at Northwestern, um, Dr. Aaron Packman, who also gives us a lot of advice on like sewer systems. He knows a lot about sewer systems. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> obviously, Caitlin. Um, and then Sarah Owens, last but not least, she runs the sequencing lab at Argonne, and her and her team do a lot of really amazing work. Um, and we're some of the first in the country, dare I say, to get some of this stuff working. Um, so... Thank you. Um, finally, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> our anonymous donors, for all of your contributions to our program. Without you, we could not exist. <laughs> I don't know that like Elon. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Aaron Packman designed this sticker. We're hoping to. Um, to create maybe them. Maybe one someday. day it will yeah. be actual stickers. Yeah, maybe someday we'll <laughs> distribute them. But yeah, thank you for participating. I want a button. <laughs> That's a good idea. And with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you so much for this presentation. I was curious um, what sort of, uh, like, who are the users of these dashboards? Do you know, like, who, who primarily is making use of this? Because that can help us have ideas of things to make. Yeah, good question. We were just talking about this today. Um, no, we just launched the dashboard in January. Um, so the original thought was to help fill a gap to with 
um, even the public health department partners. So like the local health departments, for example, like they, um, it really helps them to access the wastewater data as well. We don't, we, ha we don't know if they're using it, but like that was part of, was we sent it to them, we sent the links to them, um, was to have a place where not only the general public, but people of varying, you know, backgrounds and experience who might actually have familiarity and need this data for their job, um, like those local health, those smaller health departments that don't have the budgets to afford doing programs like this that they could access it as well. So that was sort of the target um, audience, or part of the target audience. Yeah, what public policy decisions has this data actually affected at this point in time? I do not make those decisions. <laughs> um, I don't think I could really answer that. So again, we do briefings with the public health departments every week. Um, we send them reports on where everything is, but we don't. We are not participants at DPI nor our whole pro, I, the IWS program. We are not actively making public health decisions. That's up to the public health professionals, and so they don't. It you know ask us for advice when they make those decisions. I do know that sometimes when we share the data with the, with the Illinois Department of Public Health, they may see certain plants and say, oh, maybe we should talk to those public health, like the local public health departments in specific areas based on what they see in, the, in our reports. But beyond that, the specific policies, we're not, we're not really sure. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. I was just curious, um, when you're using wastewater as a predictor for um, like disease prevalence or outbreaks, how much more accurate is this compared to like traditional modeling techniques? That's a great question. Um, I would say uh, the short answer is I don't know, mm -hmm. right? There's, uh, we do know that there are like for, for cases, for example, positive tests, testing rates are very variable and becoming less and less reliable. And so a metric of cases or of public, of positive tests is, you know, has those issues, right? Um, hospitalization rates, you would hope is more reliable because ideally if people are sick enough to go to the hospital, then they will go to the hospital and then they'll be reported. But somehow it doesn't always happen that way either, right? And for example, if the, when the, when the, when the, the when we were in particularly significant surges, the hospitals are full and then the, the hospital admissions becomes less reliable during that time because it's too full for people to go to the hospital, right? Or it may be that the time that people go to the hospital varies based on what they think about the virus and what they think about the concern about the virus, you know? There's all these things that makes that less reliable than we might hope, right? The wastewater, you know, Ideally, you know, people shed it and then it comes in and then we measure it, right? And ideally, maybe there's these other little things like the flow rate and the biomarkers and the recovery and such that we can sort of turn it into something that's quite right, right? But of course, that's not quite right either because there's all kinds of weird things that happen. And this is why we think it's really important, as Melissa was saying, that we put them all together, right? And we see that, well, this is increasing and this is increasing and this is increasing you know, that will tell us something very important, right? Um, in terms of, and, and so that's sort of in terms of like accuracy, right? But there's, it's also just generally hard to interpret accuracy, right? Um, what we do see is that as we get less and less cases and things like that, we might see like a new increase might happen a little bit earlier because the wastewater continues to be sort of what it has been, you know? So that's sort of, I don't know if that quite answers your question and to a, a, full, a full degree, but that's kind of what we have. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of touched on something I was just kind of curious about. So you mentioned earlier you have this data set that you're applying with a machine learning model. And, you know, I've never heard about this before. I know nothing about it. But I'm wondering, um, with all these variables, you get this high dimensional space. Do you have any, like you know, when you do the dimensionality reduction, do you get any like weird confounding thing that you wouldn't expect? Any like bizarre thing that's really throwing off the value, which is just some weird property of the water, or whatever's in the water? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, to be honest, we're actually fairly, fairly early in that analysis, 
right? So right now, you know, ideally this, this data set is huge and we can do all kinds of things with it and we're using like four features, you know, to sort of see how it works. And so we don't yet have any real outcomes from that. But the hope is that we would be able to find something, but I would expect that very, very possibly we could find some weird confounding thing. Another thing I want to mention too is that um, there's, there are a lot of confounding factors in this work, and one of them particularly is shedding rates as well. Um, and like Caitlin said, we have this massive data set covering several years now, um, but the, vari the, the viruses have uh, mutated, they've evolved since then. Shedding rates are different, we suspect, for, between like Omicron and Delta, for example. And what about all the sublineages of Omicron in different waves? So um, there are a lot of things to take into account. And as Caitlin said, we're just at the beginning of incorporating those into some of our models, but that's like another level of confounding factors that we're taking into consideration is shedding rates. I have a, a live stream audience member question mm -hmm. uh, that we're all dying to know. What were other runner-up names for this presentation? <laughs> oh, wait. Wait, I have them. <laughs> Hold on. Right, didn't I put them in our Slack channel? Yeah, you did. Wait, we can go to another question and I'll come we'll back. We'll come back to that. Um, so going back to the, like, industrial waste combining with all the other waste, um, do you guys have like, I guess, metrics or data that pulls out the industrial information from the clinical data already? Or how are you guys adjusting your sets? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Um, to some extent, the hope is that some of the extra water quality data might tell us some things, because that can tell us about various chemistry and um, if there's certain things that happen in it. Um, but beyond that, we don't have anything specific that pull, sort of pulls it out, per se. Um, that is also potentially one reason that comparing between sites could be problematic. Because if there's an industrial unit contributing into this site, right, that, that there's variation over time of how that unit contributes, but that unit is always contributing, right? But then if there's not one over here in this site, that, you know, that comparison might get skewed, you know. Thank you so much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the modeling, analytics, and reporting is done by the DPI as well as the Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, like, what all uh, models in machine learning do you use for the analysis of the data? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I missed it. I was looking. Yeah, at he's it. wondering it's what machine learning we're using. Oh. <laughs> so, um... We're ask Anuj. <laughs> no, not no, he's in no, India. No, no. Um, we are considering using some sort of like group lasso, so like a lasso uh, regression method, but allowing for groups so that um, to allow for uh, correlated elements and things like that. That's one that we're mainly trying to use. Um, we're also talking about uh, various clustering, um, but I'm not sure at this moment what specific uh, methods for that. Yeah. Did you find them? I think we talked about using a random forest at some point. Yeah, random forest yeah. is in the discussion as well. Okay. <laughs> There's work sort of at the stage of like, we're going to try machine learning, and here's all the things we're going to try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, the, the, the most anticipated moment of the talk. <laughs> all right, there were four options. Okay, the winner, which is flushed with insights, the promising potential of poop-based testing for public health. That's what we decided. Okay, number two, the power of poop, using wastewater-based epidemiology to track public health. Number three, flushed away, <laughs> using wastewater to monitor and control infectious diseases. And number four, which was a very strong contender as well, from poop to public health. <laughs> The power of wastewater-based epidemiology. Thank you. I believe Yasha online submitted that question. Thank you. Uh, with all of y'all's experience in wastewater, um, based on your recommendation, would you recommend ever kayaking or, dare I say, swim in the Chicago River? Well, the waste uh, I, would sh I would kayak in Chicago River. Yeah, the, wa the wastewater isn't dumped into the river, I believe. The There's... 
I mean, so I recently went to a wastewater treatment plant for the first, Caitlin and I both went. It was mm-hmm. lovely. Um, it's <laughs> somewhat smelly, but um, it's a good time. The, you know, there, it's highly regulated, right? And there's a lot of processing of the wastewater, the separating of the solids. I almost put in a photo, but I was like, I, that <laughs> need a content warning. Um, uh, but yeah, so it's clean water, the, out, the, the, the effluent from the wastewater treatment plants. But I believe in Chicago, and I may be wrong on this, but that it's the effluent is dumped like way further down the canal. Yeah, I think so. So the Chicago River is if if it has boor, poor water quality, it's not because of the wastewater. Yeah. Mm. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh yes. Yeah. So Chicago, the sewers do. Oh, oh, I would love to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, if we have time, um, I'll make it brief. Uh, the Chicago has something really cool called TARP. I always forget. It stands for Tunnel and Reservoir, and Reservoir Plan, yeah. I believe. Project. project. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Um, it is one of like the largest engineering projects ever in the world. It's still not completed. Um, and so basically what happens is um, when we have a lot of rain, there's overflow into these tarp tunnels that, that, that are huge. They could, like, you could walk inside of them 30 feet um, in diameter, and then they go to a reservoir. Um, and then over time, the water in the reservoir is then slowly pumped back through the wastewater treatment facility. Um, there's, I, I believe it's just Calumet and Stickney, um, and th- that have reservoirs that get tarp. Uh, water pumped. And so it's so that when... I think O'Brien get, might too. No, there's one that doesn't. Okay. Anyways. Never mind. The, it's on the MWRD website if you yeah. can never find it. Um, but yeah, so the water, the water gets, the storm water gets separated out and then slowly pumped back through. So it is something that we do sometimes have to take in consideration because are we diluted during a period of high rainfall, our samples are going to be diluted, right? Because if they're pumping through and we can find out from MWRD how much they've pumped through, you know, if 30% of the volume is just storm water, well, then that's going to impact our results. So, but the tarp is really cool if you look it up it's got photos it's super neat yeah in fact if you look on youtube and search like mwrd uh live tour there's like an hour hour and a half like live stream tour that they gave and it's like fascinating all kinds of information oh there's also a live stream of the (laughs) reservoir you can see how full it is Yeah. (laughs) yeah this is wow i Dr. Paretsky, who runs our lab, loves this stuff too. So I know she, if she's listening, she's enjoying this talk. But yeah, one more fun fact I will say too is Stickney is the largest plant in the entire United States, um, the wastewater treatment plant. It serves over a million people. Two and, million? Yeah. Hmm? Two million? 1.2? I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Don't ask me that. <laughs> it's on the MWRD website. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, one question I had was uh, with the data sets that you have been able to generate. I know you mentioned like larger uh, entities that have benefited from it, f- from the uh, work, like the CDCs of the world. But are there like smaller uh, agencies or organizations that could benefit from uh, this information? Yeah, we have partners, especially with the CDPH work we're doing um, on like more facilities level. Um, and like we work closely with like Cook County Jail, for example, um, with their medical director. Um, and we send them weekly reports um, on the jail and how things are. are and we're doing um, some really um, interesting work there. So, like, the idea would be that we can also help at facility levels. Um, with the IDPH program, we're doing a pilot with K-12 schools as well. Um, so there's a lot. Um, it's not just at that, you know, massive wastewater treatment plant level. There's a lot more, like what I said, upstream sampling happening at a more granular level. And we do everything we can to share data with those um, entities who, who are working with us. The live stream question is, how long does it take to eventually receive and collect these results of disease in wastewater? Yeah, so um, I believe that, so what happens is the people shed and then it travels to the waste, to the treatment plan, right? And it may take up to like eight hours 12 hours, something like this, to get to the treatment plant, maybe a day. Okay, and then it gets sampled at the treatment plant, 
and it gets put in a box and shipped via FedEx to the lab, okay? Overnight shipping. So many FedEx boxes, okay. Um, and I, it may, overnight shipping okay. with, with some ice packs, just to be sure. Um, and then it gets into the lab, and usually that day or the next day, and if it's a weekend, it might be a few extra days, um, we get a result, right? And immediately when we get a result, it goes into our data management system, and we can access that result and start putting it into a report. So we're talking about, for, for, the, for the sewers in Chicago, it's like they pick up the sample and they drive it to the lab. Yes. So it could okay. be the day of. And right? sometimes the lab even processes it the day they get it. So like you could collect a sample from a neighborhood at 8 a.m. and we've got results by 5 p.m. Right. Yeah. So but if we're getting samples right from Southern Illinois, it might be a few days. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question will be in terms of uh, scale auctions for you guys, what is the path for scaling this? Either it's going to be the geography or what kind of pathogens are you guys are thinking will be next in terms of collating more data and more useful for hospital and, and people overall? Yeah, for the scale geographically, we have a great um, team of project managers, Laura Clements and Crystal White, who do engagement directly with the plants. So any plant that's part of our program, they stay in touch with, like we send them the monthly reports of their data. Um, but they are, our, our project managers are always reaching out to new plants to see if they would like to participate in our program. And so that's where the engagement is. And specifically, they try to target counties that we are not represented yet. And so they'll target the largest wastewater treatment plant in a county that is not represented yet. So that's sort of the, the way that that works. Um, and then as far as new targets, um, like Caitlin said in the beginning of the talk, that's really decided by our partners and from CDC guidance. Um, if you go onto the CDC website, I believe they have like a list of a lot of things that they're looking for uh, or that they suggest looking for. Um, but it's really up to the needs of the public health departments um, and what they um, are interested in and what they think can help uh, the communities that they serve. So we don't, we don't decide any of that we just we say okay we'll see if we can make those assays work for you <laughs> but yeah so like I said uh, ours we scale we started with SARS-CoV-2 we added influenza A and B in the fall the start of flu season in October uh, we added RSV this spring um, so yeah that's where we're at now awesome thank you so much can everyone please give a round of applause for presenters thank you so much